If I can uh, call a meeting to order, and can I welcome everyone to this, the 13th meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2018, and particularly welcome our new committee member, David Tons. And can I take this opportunity to place on record our thanks to Rona Mackay, MSP, who served in the committee in the last year and has now moved on to um, other commitments. I want to thank her for um, the work she did in the support of the committee while she was here. So the first item on our agenda today, then, is a declaration of interest. In accordance with the terms of the interests of members of the Scottish Parliament Act 2006, can I invite David Torrance to declare any interest relevant to the remit of the committee? Thank you, Camina, for your welcome, and I have nothing to declare. Okay. Thank you very much. We now move to the next item on our agenda, which is the consideration of new petitions. The first new petition for consideration is petition 1694 four by Ralph Rudolph on the free instrumental music services. Can I welcome Liz Smith to the meeting for the consideration of this petition and understand that John Scott may join us um, during um, this session. We'll take evidence this morning from the petitioner. He is accompanied by Alison Reeves, manager in Scotland of Making Music, a membership organisation for amateur music societies, and Mick Cook, who some may associate with Bell and Sebastian, but who is here in an individual capacity representing Too Many Cooks Music Limited. Can I welcome you all, uh, and you have the opportunity to make an opening statement of up to five minutes, after which we will move to questions from the committee. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to speak to you today about musical instrument tuition in state schools in Scotland. Uh, I've brought with me 2,068 ink signatures, um, and I'd be grateful if that total could be added to the number gathered online uh, so that you get a, a measure of the support that was gathered during the six weeks when uh, the petition was open uh, for signatures. Um, this is not just a matter on which many people feel strongly. It is a matter of national importance, raising questions about the national curriculum, our goal to get it right for every child in education, about equity in the classroom and fairness, about the health and prosperity of our nation, and about the need to ensure maximum return for us all on precious public resources. We're here to ask for a change in the law so that musical instrument tuition is available as of right to all children attending state schools who wish it free of charge. In the last 10 years in Scotland, we've seen a 50% reduction in the number of specialist musical instrument teachers in our schools. We've seen an increase in the groups uh, and in the numbers of groups in groups receiving tuition, and we've seen the end of free lessons uh, for all children. The Scottish Parliament has a responsibility to ensure consistency and excellence in education right across Scotland. It is not right that children have to pay for their education in state schools in Scotland. And it's even worse, the divergence in the experience that children are having across Scotland some children still enjoy free lessons in some parts of Scotland. For everyone else, the fees range from £117 a year in Inverclyde right up to a completely unaffordable £524 a year in Clackmannanshire. Now, that's not equitous, it's not fair, it's not consistent, and it should be a matter of grave concern to the Scottish Parliament. The Scottish Parliament has so far, the Scottish Government rather, has so far taken the view that it's for local authorities to determine local priorities and local needs. But I think a change in the law is appropriate uh, because of the divergence, the lack of fairness, the lack of equity across Scotland. The Scottish Parliament has a remit in ensuring that consistency and that excellence. Fees are a barrier to education. Introducing fees has a result that some children cannot afford to pay for their education, with the ironic result that precious resources are concentrated on children who already have the most. Schools should not be seeking customers for their services. They should be providing lessons for free to all children. So we believe that instrumental music services should move away from this discretionary service and become a protected 
statutory service where it belongs. All children deserve the same chances in school, irrespective of their location, whether they live in a city or in a rural area or in Edinburgh or in Clackmannanshire or in the borders or the islands. They deserve the same opportunities and they deserve the best opportunities. Fees in state schools are wrong. Um, so, since the days of Lonnie Donegan, the Scottish music scene has been a hugely successful and globally recognised brand. When I played trumpet for Bell and Sebastian, I would often be asked in interviews with, for example, Japanese journalists, why are there so many great bands from Scotland? Is there something in the water? Um, many of these musicians benefited from free instrumental tuition at school, including household names such as Katie Tunstall, Ricky Ross and Eddie Reader. I myself took advantage of free trumpet tuition. I was sat in my primary four classroom at Hillside Primary School in Dundee when there was a knock on the door and a funny wee guy with a wondrous shiny instrument walked through the door saying, does anyone want to learn the trumpet? I immediately thrust up my hand and there began a wonderful journey of discovery, which opened so many doors for a small, shy boy from Dundee. It helped my confidence, it helped me make friends, it helped with my other schoolwork. I got good grades and I went on to get a science degree from Glasgow University. It would also eventually lead to a career, one that allowed me to travel and see the world and play on stages like the Albert Hall in London and the Hollywood Bowl in Los Angeles. I'm certain that none of this would have happened if I hadn't been inspired that day by that funny wee guy with a shiny instrument. I believe that every school child in Scotland should be given the same opportunity. Uh, good morning. I'm speaking on behalf of Making Music. We are the membership organisation for amateur music groups. There's 257 member groups in Scotland, including orchestras, brass and wind bands and traditional music groups. That's around 13,000 individuals. Our members are concerned about the erosion of instrumental tuition as they recognise it as a gateway to lifelong participation in music making and all the benefits for those musicians and their communities. We have a huge, rich and varied amateur music culture in Scotland, much of it volunteer-led and self-financing with very little direct cost to taxpayer. But the sector relies on an infrastructure of services provided by local councils and government, including instrumental music tuition, which provides a steady flow of skilled musicians from instrumental services and their associated bands and orchestras. Those who don't make music their job, but for whom it remains a valued part of their leisure time. The upfront investment in tuition pays back many times over in improved health and well-being of lifelong music makers and in the economic benefits of healthy, connected and empowered communities. We believe that making the service statutory will stop the uneven provision we have currently, ensure consistency and quality and in the long term, retain access for whoever chooses it to excellent lifelong music making opportunities. Thank you, okay. Thank you very much for that. We can now move um, <coughs> to the questions. And first question from Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, um, convener. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, and can I say at the outset, you certainly uh, present a strong case uh, for the petition. Um, our briefing refers to a survey conducted by the Improvement Service in 2017 which found that fees uh, charges covered between 2% and 58% of the cost of the service. Uh, now, the report found that uh, there was no correlation between uh, numbers of pupils taking lessons and the fees charged, although it, it added that, uh, and I quote, this does not mean that the cost of fees do not influence parents' decisions as to whether pupils partake in lessons. So I wonder if you could give the committee your views on that. Happy for me to answer that. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you. That's, that's a good question. The report you refer to is one of the annual reports undertaken by the Improvement Service. Uh, that's from 2017. The next one is due out, I think, at the end of October. And what that report will capture is a very significant um, development from the last round of local authority budgets, uh, where things suddenly got a lot worse. Uh, I mean, in Clackmannanshire, the fees were already high at £228 a year, uh, but they've been doubled uh, to £524. Um, and 
we don't have all the figures yet for the dropout uh, rate, uh, but early indications are 40% uh, in Clackmannanshire. In West Lothian, uh, there were, I mean, that is a, a, a part of the country that has been absolutely outstanding in its music making. Um, and the budget decision was to cut um, the funding by half. Um, and where that story ended up, as you probably know, is an introduction of three fees of £345 a year. I've got friends who teach uh, in that area, and they are telling me that 90% of their students have handed back their instruments. In East Lothian uh, in March, uh, fees of £290 were introduced. Uh, that's a poor area. Um, and uh, a, a teacher has approached me to say that uh, a girl handed back her instrument in tears at the end of the year, can't afford the fees, and then she reappeared after the summer to say that her mum had had a whip round and could she please have lessons again. Uh, in South Ayrshire, where I'm from, uh, that is a, a part of the world where there's extreme deprivation, but also considerable affluence. Um, there are 216 children who have handed back their instruments uh, since the fees were uh, introduced. That's uh, out of a total of uh, 1,200, 100 of whom are on free school meals. Um, so I, I predict, however, in areas where there is sufficient affluence, that what we'll see is instruments being taken out of the hands of children who are in the squeezed middle and can't afford to continue and handed to children whose parents are better off. It's such a valuable service. Parents know how valuable this is. And it has traditionally been an oversubscribed service. And so in areas where uh, there is sufficient affluence, you will see uh, an unjust uh, movement of instruments from children who can't afford it, who then have to watch the instruments turning up in the hands of children who can afford it. That is divisive. No child should have to come back to school and say, I can't afford to carry on with lessons. I mean, that is just wrong. Now, the picture across Scotland is a complex one. It's difficult to draw direct correlations between decisions on fees and uptake of a service and success. Fees of £117 in Inverclyde, that's at the low end. But I would suggest that if you introduced that in Edinburgh, uh, where mortgage poverty is a real thing, uh, that would have a different effect to an introdu uh, introduction of £117 in an area where, where that isn't an issue. So the picture is complex, and any attempt to try and justify fees uh, is going to run into uh, complexity. Uh, and I, I want people to be aware of the complexity of this and to hold on to some principles uh, that education should be free, and viewing children as customers uh, is not progress. Thanks. It, it's helpful that you've provided, you know, the example of the dropout uh, figure for Clackmannanshire. Um, but if you have any uh, other um, figures that you could share with the committee after the meeting, um, and any, even some anecdotal evidence of, of, uh, of what's happening out there, it would be helpful. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Rachel Hamilton. Um, the report found that a number of the full-time equivalent music instructor posts fell from 660 in 1516 to 640 in 1617. And you stated in your opening statement that the increase in the numbers receiving, um, there was an increase in the numbers receiving um, tuition, so it's obviously um, something that's growing in popularity. But what impact do you believe uh, that uh, charging for musical tuition will ultimately have on the availability of um, music teachers? <clears throat> okay. Um, again, the report statistics are from the, the last report, 2017, and I, I, all eyes on the next report, because what we've seen in the last round of local authority budgets has been unprecedented. And you're going to see a very different picture coming out of the next report, because we've seen a shocking round of of cuts and uh, an just an unsustainable uh, number of increases. Perth and Kinross have decided to increase ch charges by 60% over the next three years. I mean, where else do you, do you, do you expect customers to, abs customers to absorb a 60% increase uh, in such a short period of time? Uh, so the numbers, on, on the point about the numbers of teachers, uh, 10 years ago we had 1,200 
specialist musical instrument teachers in Scotland, and now we've only got 600 and so many. I mean, that's a horrendous reduction. Uh, I went to school, uh, state school, Four Hill Primary in Ayr uh, in the 80s. I can remember not being able to get into the building because it was shut, because there wasn't enough coal to heat the building to keep the children warm. Well, that was a difficult uh, decade. Uh, my dad was a teacher in the local authority. My mum was a secretary at the, at the local hospital. Uh, interest rate, uh, and, we had, and they had a mortgage. Interest rates got up to 15%. Um, I hope I don't embarrass my parents if they watch this, but I remember the strategies that my parents uh, deployed in order to keep paying the mortgage. Uh, if I'd come home and said, can I have £100 a year to learn, continue learning my trombone lessons, it, it would have been a heartbreaking no. So if we can provide one-to-one -one tuition in Scotland in the 80s, which is what I got, I think that's what you got, Mick. Mm -hmm. Alison, did you get one-to-one -one tuition? Uh, if we can provide it in the 80s, a very tough decade in Scotland. I don't understand why things are so much worse now that we can't do it now. Margaret Thatcher scrapped free tuition in England in the 90s. We held on to it in Scotland until 10 years ago. Uh, 10 years ago is when the financial crash uh, took place and uh, you know, things got tough. And, you know, we've come through a tough decade. But during that decade, we have not held on to a service that we have held on to in previous difficult decades. In Scotland, uh, instrumental music tuition really took off in the 70s. Uh, that was a tough decade. In the United Kingdom as a whole, the increase in provision in schools has been at its greatest in the 1920s and the 1950s. You know, you don't get tougher decades than post-war decades. Uh, but the vision was there, uh, and the appreciation of the service was there to invest in it and to give children this opportunity. Uh, and so why are we taking our eye off the ball? I think, I think we're being complacent. As Mick said, you go around Scotland and people know how good we are at making music in this country. Uh, and it's not the quality of the water that we drink, good though it is, it's the quality of the education that Scotland is famous for uh, and the inclusive uh, nature of it uh, that has led to that. So we're talking about children getting lessons in schools and the benefits to them uh, of that and the way it strengthens communities. Um, but let's not forget that this is a massive export industry. Um, and I don't know if you saw the Ed Sheeran uh, interview on the news a couple of weeks ago, he made the really interesting point that the tax receipts uh, from the creative industries are enormous. And not only that, uh, our highest paid uh, musicians uh, who went to state school and got their lessons there tend to stay in the United Kingdom and pay their taxes here. I mean, the economic uh, returns are tremendous uh, if that is the box you want to tick uh, to justify free lessons. Could I just interrupt you and ask if Alison Reeves and uh, Mick Cook have any um, comments they'd like to make on the impact of charging for musical um, tuition that will have in the future on the numbers of teachers that are coming through the education system, please? You know, it can only have a negative impact. I mean, I think as Ralph pointed out, it's, it's going to make a two-tier system where it's only children who, whose parents can afford to send them uh, for free lesson, for lessons. Sorry. Um, and that's, I can only make a two-tiered system. I think, actually, I want to add to Ralph's point about um, why music is so strong in Scotland. I think it's the value that people in Scotland place upon music. And in fact, your story about the, the wee girl who had to hand back her instrument, and there was a whip round in the community to pay for her lessons, I think that proves the point that people value music so much in this country. And to see it being charged for it is entirely wrong, in my opinion. I think the point that you raised about the numbers of music tutors dropping while the numbers of children learning stays the same is the crucial point, actually, because um, that is the numbers game that the councils will continue to play, I think, is that they will continue to tell us that it's the same amount of children, but maybe the same amount of children learning in groups which are much larger, so the quality of the service they're getting is much poorer. And also... If there is a limited provision, as Ralph has pointed out, um, those children who can't afford it will drop out 
and be replaced by children who may have less of an inclination to learn, but whose parents can afford to pay for it. At the moment, say eight out of 30 children in my son's class are going to be offered uh, the opportunity to play the violin. And if he then had to pay for that, or we had to then pay for that, and we dropped out, he, his place would be taken by somebody who has potentially had less of an ability or who had less of an inclination to learn but who could afford to pay for it, and that is not fair. Is that in the, my, son's school, my, son's, my sons go to school in, in Mary Lee in, in uh, Glasgow, and um, they're, they've not been offered lessons until P5, and it's actually eight out of 80 children are being offered violin lessons. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, it's a very small number being offered. Compared to when I was at school, in a, state, a state school in Dundee, it was offered to anyone who wanted to try an instrument. It was We had a symphony orchestra in the school because our our headmaster was very into music and he actually played a trad jazz band and he, he used to play alongside the children, um, play, play trumpet alongside the children on a, on a wee chair. It was, it was amazing. Unbelievable opportunities, which, you know, have stayed with me to this day. It's been unbelievable. Um, thank you, Kibina. Thank you to the, the panel for their, um, for the evidence. And um, I, I can say I recognise Mr Cook's journey. Um, and that sort of access to opportunity uh, within school. Um, I think, you know, uh, you can substitute music for art or drama, or in certain cases, sport. Uh, and and uh, having having had that opportunity at school, have gone on a, a, a journey that took me uh, round, round the world, and I think that's an opportunity I wouldn't have had had it not been for that uh, introduction at school. So I just want to put that on record. And can I ask, uh, you refer to business leaders calling for changes in the way children are taught, uh, with a move from a, a away from a knowledge-based education. And I wonder what sort of business leaders are you referring to here, and, and, and do you have examples of those? Thank you. <clears throat> I would um, recommend that you go on to the World Economic Forum uh, Facebook page and website, and look for the videos posted by Jack Ma. Uh, the way he describes it can't be beaten. Uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely phenomenal. Um, I was sitting in uh, the back seat <coughs> of a car uh, the weekend, driving down, being driven down to uh, Middlesbrough to take part in a brass band competition. I play with Dal Mellington Band. Um, and uh, the driver of the car uh, said, look, I can press this button and the car drives itself. And he took his hands off. And uh, I thought, this is amazing. Computers can do so much. Uh, for us these days, but there are three things that computers cannot do. Uh, they cannot show empathy. They cannot have original thoughts. And they cannot mimic hum human creativity. And so Jack Ma's point uh, is that these are the things we need to focus on in education. Now, I agree we should keep teaching uh, the three R's and all the rest of it, but we must not let go of the uh, education in the arts, um, because it's those things that give children so much resilience uh, and equip them to be creative. Uh, I mean, what, what jobs are our kids going to be doing uh, 10 years from now? I mean, it's, it's, it's a real pause for thought, uh, because anything that can be automated will be automated. Um, you know, even driving uh, is becoming automated. Um, train, will we will have train drivers in 10 years, will we will have bus drivers. Um, so children need to be nourished in the humanities. Thank you. And you, you refer to Scotland's worldwide reputation for the quality of its instrumental music and state that music plays a central low, a role in Scotland's current cultural heritage. What are your thoughts on any impacts if the Scottish Government decide not to invest in musical services? Uh, yes, our particular perspective is about um, uh, the community music, and all of you will have had the experience of being at the Gala Day with the brass bands and the you know choral concerts at Christmas. And uh, it's the value of that to our culture that we're particularly concerned about and just reducing the flow of the skill set that's coming out of school and into our amateur music uh, groups and uh, our amateur music culture. There's huge amounts of evidence and I can I can send some links on to you. 
um, about the impacts on health and well-being, and then, of course, all the uh, knock-on to economic impacts that that has. Um, and all through life, I mean, we're talking about uh, mental health for young people, we're talking about uh, community health, but we're talking as well about uh, the impact on people playing musical instrument on uh, rheumatoid ar ar arthritis, or for those people singing. Uh, on cardiovascular health, and those those impacts are provable. So this that's a concern we would have is that you're taking away the opportunity to uh, have those benefits for people for the whole of their life, and then the impacts that that will have on the communities that they belong to, and just reducing the opportunity for those people who are least able to afford it and who would most benefit from that. So that that's what our con mostly our concern is in this case. From a commercial music point of view, I've been doing some research for the last 10 days or so, put a, a shout out on Facebook to, to, to get some names of people who got free musical instrument tuition as a, as a child. And I mean, I, you know, as well as Ricky Ross, Katie Tunstall, Eddie Reader that I, I mentioned, Stuart Murdoch from Bell and Sebastian, four of the members of Bell and Sebastian, Stuart Braithwaite from Mogwai, Donald Shaw, the TV composer, member of Capacelli, the current bassist with Iggy Pop, um, the head of a &R at Decca Records, um, the, the list goes on. That, that, I mean, basically, these people have been supported by free musical instrument tuition at school. All, all their emails said, without that, they wouldn't be where they are today. So I think from a commercial music point of view, I don't think we'd be where we are today without the support that people had when they were children. So I think you're going to see a kind of lost generation of, of, of you know, that all that's going to die, I think, really, without this support from, you know. Thank you, Thank you Karina. Good morning, panel. Um, as somebody who benefited from free music tuition um, and has spent years playing the guitar and would probably have never been able to play the guitar to the level that I can, um, I could sympathise with your petition. But our briefing refers to a report that John Swinney, the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills, has agreed to discuss the future of a service with local authorities and members of the Music Education Partnership Group. What are your views on this? Just, just to clarify, my, my views on the work with yes. lo uh, local authorities and the, yes. yeah, okay, th it's great. I mean, um, I've become involved in uh, what is an enormous campaign, really, uh, to preserve um, free musical instrument uh, tuition in Scotland. So, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned the MEPG, uh, which John Wallace chairs. Um, w when he and I first spoke about six months ago, uh, we had a few conversations and um, he said to me, how are you feeling? Um, and um, I thought that's quite an interesting question because I think he probably detected that there was an intensity uh, in my uh, involvement. And, uh, you know, that, uh, and he said, you know, I've been doing this for years and years and years. So I'm glad that you're frustrated and I'm glad that you're showing the anger. Uh, but uh, believe me, this is a, an enormous uh, task to try and secure the place of music in our uh, curriculum. So uh, we're very fortunate to, ha um, to have um, the dialogue that we have. Uh, we just need to make sure that uh, it, it, it converts into some change, because if we continue on the current trajectory, I think I can quote John Wallace on this and say that uh, the instrumental music services will be gone. Uh, in a, a period of years. Uh, so we, we need to find a solution to this. And it's extremely exasperating um, to uh, approach a local authority and say, please uh, prioritise this, uh, and to be told that we're not getting enough money uh, from the Scottish Government, therefore we have to find the savings somewhere. And then you come to the Scottish Government and uh, you're told that it's a, an, an issue for local authorities to determine as they see best. Uh, I use the image of politicians shrugging their shoulders and blaming each other. It's not good enough. This is really important. The backwards and forwards blame game is not getting us anywhere. Uh, and so, with all due respect, uh, you know, please find a way of exerting the power you have here to change the law. Local authorities are up against it. Everybody's up against it. Times are tough. And if there is an opportunity to make a cut lawfully, local authorities have to 
consider those opportunities. And so that's why I'm asking the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to change the law. It doesn't make sense for instrumental music tuition to be separate from the curriculum. Music is a curricular subject. It's in the curriculum. You have to learn music all through primary school and you have to learn it in first year and second year at school. Same as maths, English, history, all the other subjects. That's great. If you want to go on and study music uh, in third year and, and beyond, um, you, you need to arrive at that point able to play a musical instrument. You just do. You can't study music seriously and not be very competent on a musical instrument. And so if you don't start your free tuition until third year, it's not going to happen. So we'll have a situation where children in primary school, which is when you need to start, who can afford it, will get their lessons and they'll arrive in third year and think, I want to study music seriously and I've already got five years of musical instrument tuition under my belt. Um, and other children won't have had that opportunity. That, that is wrong. And I think, there, I think there must be a failure to understand how important it is to the study of music to be able to play a musical instrument. If you want to learn a foreign language, but you have to pay for grammar lessons, it, it doesn't make sense. If you want to learn biology, but you have to pay for hands-on time in the lab, it doesn't make sense. If you want to learn mathematics, but you have to pay to be introduced to the concepts of algebra, it doesn't make sense. It does not make sense to be unable to learn a musical instrument if you want to study music seriously. And very often people say, well, you know, can, can we afford these small group lessons? Well, we've afforded it before, and I don't think we should be apologetic that learning to play a musical instrument is, is a difficult challenge, and it is best achieved in small groups, even one-to-one -one groups. Um, I'd like to make the point uh, that uh, a friend of mine who is retired as a musical instrument teacher in England after a long, long career told me that uh, because he was dyslexic himself, he spotted 37 students over his career who he thought were dyslexic and he referred them on and it turned out they were able to receive specialist support Be because of that close working between pupil, uh, student and pupil. He spotted something that wasn't apparent to others. Other teachers have told me uh, that they have received disclosures from children, confidences, because of the trust that is created in a small group setting. Uh, and to lose that it would be uh, very wrong as well. And to come back to the point about interest rates, um, local authorities are doing their best, I hope, to keep fees as low as possible. But if we see a spike in interest rates, if we see a return in interest rates to any kind of normal level, there's going to be a clear out of children learning. So is it acceptable to the Scottish Parliament that an increase in interest rates could wipe out an educational service? Thank you. The panel's obviously very well briefed uh, to get to this point today, but I wonder if I could cast your mind back to 2012 um, when the Scottish Government set up the Instru Instrumental Music Group and that was to examine some of the um, issues surrounding musical tuition. Do you have any uh, comments on the recommendations that were made from that and, and would you use that as a sort of a blueprint with what you're actually trying to achieve now? One of the recommendations that came out of Green's report in 2013 was that we need to have a national vision statement for music that includes instrumental music tuition. That was one of his recommendations, and we don't have that yet. John Wallace tells me that uh, there's considerable research underway at the moment to help inform uh, that, um, to, so that we have a, a proper understanding of uh, the role of instrumental music within the study of music. And so I, I think if we could get there, I think that would pave the way for good decisions. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, it, it, for some reason, there is a disconnect between the study of music in the curriculum 
and the opportunity to learn to play a musical instrument properly. I think if that can be connected together and if the importance of playing a musical instrument can be properly understood in the context of music and we have a national vision statement for that, I think we'd be in a much, much stronger place. It would be easier for local authorities to make decisions if the power is to remain with them. And it would be easier for the Scottish Parliament to pass legislation to put instrumental music on a proper protected statutory footing. So I would like to see that piece of work reach a conclusion. It was one of Green's recommendations in 2013. Okay, Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, um, Camille. If I can refer back to our, our meeting papers, which refer to written evidence that was, was submitted to the Education and Skills Committee earlier this year. Um, have you had the opportunity to, to look at that, uh, uh, to look at those submissions? And if you have, do you have any comments on them? I, I have seen them. They, they are on, uh, publicly available. Um, I don't have any particular comments on them. OK. Thanks. Can I ask about, um, you believe that really ultimately the Scottish Government should just take um, matters into their own hands and invest in instrumental musical services. Um, I wonder if you can tell us what you think that would look like, if you get a sense of the level of investment. Would it be the be a national fund or a ring fest fund to local authorities? And um, have you looked at how you think that might work? No, no, you can't. OK, so the... Improvement Service Report from 2017 um, says that local authorities currently spend £27 million a year delivering the service, from which uh, four million, uh, oh, sorry, and £4 million of that comes from fees. Uh, so to quantify uh, our request, um, I, th I think we can look to that report. Um, so you're probably talking about £30 million pounds a year if instrumental uh, lessons are to be free. <clears throat> and that's to stand still uh, to where we are, uh, remembering that uh, you know while things are still good, we still have something worth preserving. Uh, but only 10 years ago, we had something considerably stronger uh, than we do. So if we can secure the current level of spending on it, that would be, I hope, a platform to then start progressing, because this is an opportunity. Uh, if we can increase the take-up uh, by children of musical instrument tuition, we're winning. We are absolutely winning. Uh, and I'd like to say just a word about uh, the concessions that are available. Lo local authorities try very hard to make sure that children who are um, in the least well-off parts of our communities can still access tuition for free. And so Typically, uh, if children are entitled to free school meals, then they're entitled to free tuition. Um, and, you know, I, I, I applaud that. Um, uh, uh, but the truth is that take-up from children uh, in our most deprived areas of musical instrument tuition is stubbornly low. It's very difficult to get uh, children uh, from our poorest communities, our most deprived communities, to take up this opportunity. And no doubt there are many reasons for that. Uh, but uh, for sure, uh, introducing fees so that children in the squeezed middle are excluded and the proportion of children from the most well-off families taking up the service increasing, for sure, that won't improve uptake from the areas in society where arguably uptake is most needed. If there's a, a vicious circle around staffing levels, you know, having anecdotally known some folk who have who are musicians themselves and have ended up they might have looked at that option but have thought that it was too insecure and, and increasingly insecure and indeed folk who have done that job going around schools um, being instrumental teachers have found it to be a more difficult and less stable career than it was in the past. Do you think, I don't know if you have access to uh, young people who are musicians, who are studying as musicians, who are not looking at this as an option for the future? And does that then become, I mean, how do we stop that lack of confidence as a career option, which then means there'll be fewer opportunities for young people? 
I, th I think historically uh, becoming a, a peripatetic music teacher, uh, as, as they're known, uh, has been a, a, a real career aspiration for many uh, children leaving school uh, who are well-equipped uh, musicians. Um, and it cannot look like an attractive uh, proposition. Uh, where, you know, if you started school um, 10 years ago and you're coming out of university now, uh, and you can see that half of the teachers who were teaching 10 years ago are no longer doing it, and you can see that the one-to-one -one tuition is by and large gone, and children are being taught in much larger groups, uh, that's got to look less appealing. The ability to teach one-to-one -one is a different thing from the ability to teach in larger groups. Um, I read an article recently uh, about training ships uh, from 150 years ago, where uh, boys who were homeless uh, 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 where it could go onto a training ship and learn industrial skills. Uh, and these ships had bands. And so 150 years ago, uh, somebody wrote that teaching boys uh, is an interesting thing. Uh, some boys, um, if you don't keep on at them and constantly harass them, they'll never make any progress. Other boys, one uh, harsh word and they'll not play a note. Other children need to take what you've told them away and think about it quietly and bring back their progress and show you. So teaching one-to-one uh, -one is a particular skill. Teaching in large groups is a very different thing. Uh, so people who 10 years ago received one-to-one -one tuition but now emerge into the, mar into the workplace contemplating a very different model um, might not uh, find it quite as uh, an attractive a proposition. Okay, thank you. I'm going to ask. Um, Sorry, just add a point there about um, musicians' careers as well. So the Creative Scotland produced a really good report last year on diversity in the cultural sector, and um, there's a really high percentage of uh, people working in culture sector who earn a really small amount of money from a portfolio career, and a lot of musicians in the instrumental service are, are doing that as part of this portfolio career and people are, are earning well below um, a national average for for working in culture sector and you know I think your point is really crucial about the impact on not just the pupils but the teachers and all the instrumentalists and musicians working in that sector and um, the draft culture strategy is going looking at ways of, uh, of impacting on uh, incomes for artists and I think it would be worth considering this as a, as, you know as a good route for employment for those people who have these very unstable and low income careers. Okay, thank you. I'm going to ask um, our guests to do, Liz Smith and John Scott, if they want to take the opportunity to ask uh, some questions. Thank you, convener. Yes, I, I would if that's all right. Um, thank you very much for the presentation that you've uh, made this morning. Um, it is very persuasive and I uh, sat with the previous convener of the Education Committee just before the parliamentary recess and heard exactly the same thing from many of your colleagues, uh, including John Wallace, who I think you mentioned earlier. And I had a visit uh, to the Royal Conservatoire during the holidays and I heard exactly the same thing uh, from them. I personally don't think there is any lack of political will in this. Um, I think, in fact, I don't even believe this is a party political issue. I think it is extremely important uh, for all the reasons that you set out. Um, but can I just go to a point, Mr Riddick, that you mentioned earlier. When it goes into the blame game between politicians, and that's not helpful, it's because cutbacks have to be made in parts of public spending. And if we are to find enough money to do what you're asking us, which I think is very important, I actually think we're going to need far more than £30 million because I think the dem potential demand in this area is actually uh, very considerable, we're actually going to have to find the money to be able to do this. And what I'm interested to hear from you is whether you think that we would have to muddle along with cutbacks to other services, which is not going to be very popular, and it's certainly going to politicise the debate, or is there scope to find additional funding? Um, you've mentioned about the uh, excellence of the Scottish music industry, and if you look abroad to some of the examples of countries that have done maybe a bit better than us, there have been examples of additional funding that have come in from other sources. Do you accept that that is a possible way forward? Okay, thank you for that question. 
uh, we're straying right into some big political questions here, uh, and I'm going to uh, step back uh, from that. Um, I think the case for universal access in schools for all children, for free, is strong. I think it merits the investment. If we can secure the current spend of 30 million and then grow from there, I'd be happy. Um, you mentioned the wider context in which music exists, um, and you hint, I think, that perhaps third parties could provide some funding and investment, perhaps in a public-private uh, partnership. Uh, I would ask, why music? Why not mathematics? Why not English? Why not history? There's something about education that should be protected. And I don't think the problem here, is, the specific problem with instrumental music is lack of money. I think it's lack of understanding of the importance of, the, of learning to play a musical instrument in the context of a proper, excellent education. That is where the problem lies. And if you hand over, if you hand over responsibility for funding that to third parties for music, then why not hand it over for education as a whole? But we're getting into political territory. Uh, can I just come back on that? I mean, in theory, it would be very nice to have everything that's free. Um, but I don't think we are there in terms of the practicalities. And I think local authorities will come back at you and say, uh, we, we simply can't afford this. We would like to, but we can't. And if you, if you look to uh, America, uh, there are examples of third parties who have provided the instruments uh, to the schools in order to uh, boost the level of activity. Now, I'd be interested in your thoughts about this. I mean, I, personally, if we can get these instruments and we can provide some support for the teachers uh, who could deliver that music education, I would be interested in looking at where we can get that. If, if we're going to be told by the Scottish Government and by local authorities that we can't afford it, is it not better to have it through some other means than not have it at all? The Scottish Government finds the in the budget every year uh, enough money to pay for our national performance companies, the, the ballet company, the, um, the chamber orchestra. And th that money is found every year. This, the money to feed those orchestras has to be found as well. So the investment can be found to pay for national performance companies. Can the investment not be found to pay for the education that's required to feed those companies? But, but where's it going to come from? That, that's, that's the point that we need to do. I think we can solve this problem if we find that additional uh, spend. That, that's what I'm asking. And I think that you know, we, we have to be realists in this. At the moment, public finance is very tight for all sorts of different reasons. And I think there are good examples abroad, um, and I think the Royal Conservatoire would, would argue this too, there are good examples where some additional help has been forthcoming uh, from outside sources. And sorry. That will be a matter that should be on just the petitioners themselves. I mean, it's reasonable for the petitioners to make their case, which they have done, that should be funded by the state. And perhaps in our investigations, we might want to look at, at what those examples are, um, rather than assumption. You're going to have to find that argument, but I think it's probably true now. What was I'm going to take John and then Brian, and I would like to wrap it up after that, if it's OK. Um, thank you, um, convener. Uh, thank you for making me welcome here today. Uh, welcome to Mr Riddiff and my constituent and your colleagues on the panel. Um, and can I just say, as, as Mr Riddiff is my constituent, I'm here to support him today in his quest um, for essentially universal funding um, for um, music called instrument tuition. Um, I think we have a duty as politicians to, to endeavour to produce the next generation of children in as, as well educated as they possibly can be. Um, I'm concerned uh, at the moment that all the indicators are that educational attainment is falling. And without being political, I really don't want to be political, but that these are the facts notwithstanding. And, and this would just be another component part of 
that um, the uptake in language is, is reducing, um, and I don't want to see a musical instrument tuition also um, being reducing. Uh, so I am very much supportive. I think there's maybe, if we're looking at budgets, there's possibly budgets such as the as Raplock in, in Stirling, which is a, a spend-to-save budget, which the, the community benefits there in one of uh, in that area in Stirling, where the musical instrumentation has um, produced and tuition has produced enormous community benefits. Um, I think is an example where perhaps funding could be found, particularly if, as Mr. Ridder uh, persuasively argues, that it is the most disadvantaged families and children who are likely to um, not be able to afford musical instrumentation and uh, tuition. So uh, I'm, I'm very supportive of this of petition. Um, I, I, I have had other than Mr Ridder constituents approach me um, Parents work, both parents working, just saying they are handing back. They they can't afford um, their the tuition fees, and so I just my question was: Did I hear you correctly when you said that there were two hundred and sixteen children in South Ayrshire had handed back um, their instruments, which I find a, a, a very despairing figure, if that indeed is the case. Yes, that's correct. There was an FOI uh, in just over the summer, number 8385, uh, which sets out all the information, uh, and it was 216. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, in the discussion today, we, we seem to have focused very much on uh, careers within music through, through the, the education system, given... You know that I am I am starting to recognise that my uh, my career potentially as, as as a rock guitarist is fading, um, um, much as a, a more more due to the fact that uh, 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 due to a severe lack of talent. Um, what I wanted to look, look to explore is, is is the impact of being able to uh, play a musical instrument as as you know I use it as my my frustration. I'm going to smash my guitar by <laughs> much to the, to, to the spare of my neighbours. It's it's more around that that sort of confidence, and resilience, and and the impact on life that being able to play play a musical instrument. And I wonder if that, that that's something we haven't really talked about today. I wonder if you you, you have an opinion on that. The good news in Scotland is that we have a, a very large and very healthy amateur music culture. So for the large uh, numbers of children who come out of the service who do not wish to choose that as a career, there, there is an ability to move forward and to play, continue to play. And it could be in your bedroom playing the rock guitar, but it could be as part of a really excellent standard orchestra, for example, the Glasgow Orchestral Society, which is norm, uh, almost 150 years old this year. Um, or the Aberdeen Chamber Orchestra. And uh, I spoke to them this week and they affirmed that, yes, almost all of their players had come through instrumental music tuition services. They play to an extremely high standard. The fee to participate in an orchestral society like that, somewhere between £100 and £200 a year on average, um, it's not a significant amount of money if you think about how much a gym membership is or you know cinema tickets are now. So the ability... The, there are vast amounts of opportunities to continue to play. And we know from the research and the literature that the impact on health and well-being to the individuals is, is huge. And mental health, um, reducing isolation, but also the physical impact on your, on your body of playing a musical instrument and particularly singing um, is really crucial. And it's important to note that a lot of singers who sing in choral societies need to read music. And where did they learn to read music? learning to play a musical instrument so it's a cross you know it's a transferable skill um, and uh, so the, the, we're not talking about turning out professionals although there's an excellent uh, turn up turn around rate for that we're talking about uh, investing in something that is uh, gives quality of life to everybody and should be available to everybody Surely. Um, I, I feel that we haven't really looked at what the Scottish Government are currently doing with regards to the um, Youth Music Initiative that 
the you know all the rebuttals in the press with regards to the musical tuition um, issues have been that the Scottish government are providing this 109 million over the last decade, and I just wondered if we should have explored a little bit more about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for raising that point. So. Um, I see uh, the YMI uh, as an amazing uh, uh, potential solution to the problem of uh, children not having the confidence to stick up their hand and say, yeah, I'll, I'll take that opportunity. Uh, or from um, you know, for children not getting a chance for some other reason, because it's whole, it's whole class tuition. Um, so ch all the children in the class will get um, a half hour lesson or something like that uh, once a week for most of the primary school year. At the end of which I've seen videos of uh, te uh, teachers leading a class and it's, it's quite impressive what can be achieved. Uh, and so I think that's absolutely tremendous. It gives a real opportunity to every child to have a go uh, and to get something out of it and that's really, really good. Uh, the problem, and I refer to it in the text of my petition, is that at the end of that free tuition, uh, if you go home and say to your mum and dad, I want to carry on learning the violin, uh, can I, uh, here's an invoice, um, the answer might be no. And so wouldn't it be better to invest in generating and stimulating an interest in this subject, which is so valuable and so beneficial, as a way of feeding children in to the core uh, service, which is the instrumental music service, where you can progress with your studies uh, on a, from a specialist uh, teacher. So in, in a classroom music setting, um, in primary school, you might learn the recorder or uh, strum a guitar or play some chords on a, on a keyboard. Uh, but that's, and that, that's great, that introduces you to music. But if you want to master the violin, you need to be taught by a, a, a specialist violin teacher. If you want to play a brass instrument, you need that specialist tuition. So why am I uh, seems to be uh, stimulating an opportunity that's then not capitalised upon because some children then can't afford uh, to carry on and because the core service is getting weaker and weaker. Thank you, thank you very much for that. I think that's been a, um, a really interesting session and, and I did let it run on longer than I would normally as an ex-school teacher allow anything to run on, but I think it was important that we had the opportunity to um, explore all, all these issues and I think we've learned a lot from that. I should maybe declare an interest as the mother of, a, of a, a son who benefited from tuition in Glasgow and the experience of going away as a group, performing in the city halls and all of those kind of things, which is much more than just about the music, but the joy of making music together. And I think it's something that certainly um, I always felt that Glasgow didn't sing loudly enough about. And I'm interested, I would hate to think that other young people weren't getting that opportunity as, as we go forward. So I wonder if we've got suggestions, um, comments or suggestions for action around this petition. My sense is that people feel very, that they have, you know, they're warm towards the petition, but we need to think about how we take it forward. Uh, Rachel? Convener, the um, petitioners have given a very strong argument uh, towards uh, looking closer at this. And I, I do think perhaps we should write to the Scottish Government to ask them to to, for their consideration of this strong petition? Not, I think we would be looking for more from them simply than the stated fact that this is a matter for local authorities. It's how they respond to the fact that local okay. authorities are not, um, for whatever reason, um, providing the level of service that the petitioners in particular would want. I so would be interested in, in the views of the musician unions, because I think they may have a, a view. You talked about precarious work and whether there is something there in terms of generating um, career opportunities. Uh, Brian? Uh, would, it be, would it be appropriate to, uh, to uh, then uh, speak to the local authorities? I ask mm -hmm. the local authorities. Uh, there seems a big disparity in the, the way local authorities are approaching this, so perhaps um, having their opinion on this would be... Sure. Yeah. So, so individual local authorities and COSLA, perhaps, both. Yeah. Yeah. John? Um, thank you, convener. Mm -hmm. um, just could I suggest that given the benefits way beyond the actual learning of music and the ability to play an instrument, but the benefits to communities and society at large, if those sort of areas could be explored in a sort of spend to uh, save we uh, the fact that many young people are learning an instrument who might otherwise have time in their hands and, and not enough to do. Um, 
uh, these are also benefits in, in to the communities and also there's, I think it was only touched on but given the, the report today that's out about mental health um, issues and the difficulties and, uh, and the growing problem of mental health uh, and the self-evident benefits that are come from musical instrument learning and tuition in terms of mental health. Um, I just think that there may be an opportunity to explore other budgets other than purely educational budgets uh, and local authority budgets within I, the I Scottish Government. I think that's a fair enough point, unless it becomes something that's everybody's responsibility and therefore nobody's responsibility, because I am interested in the point that's made as why is mu music tuition seen as something that's not core. And there may, there may be an argument that judgments have been made inside education departments, local authorities, they're making precisely that, that decision. When I, and, I, and I very much am alive to what is said about you can't... My own son went on to do an advanced side of music, but he wouldn't have been able to do that unless he started violin in primary school. So why are, they, why are local authorities feeling that, that they can make that distinction with this subject? And then I think that then takes you to where the other opportunities are. Um, anyone else we should be speaking to? Angus? Yes, thanks, um, convener. Given that we are <coughs> agreeing to contact uh, local authorities, I think we should um, specifically ask each, each and every one of them uh, what the dropout rate is um, over the past year or the past two years since we, we saw the cuts coming in and, and the charges uh, doubling in, in, some, in some areas. So, so it's a specific uh, request for that information. Um, I think it would be helpful and also it might help concentrate their minds if, if we ask them what their projected dropout rate would be if, if, if things continue. Um, and also, um, I note in our papers that the EIS uh, support the petition um, and they've got the campaign Change the Tune running mm -hmm. uh, at the moment uh, to protest at the budget cuts to music services. So I'd be keen to get on record something from the EIS as well. Um, so if we could write to them. OK, I think these are, these are a reasonable place to start to try and establish. I think we really ha would be wanting in our correspondent to get beyond the line to take, which is budget cuts and it's a matter for local authorities and try and get a sense. For Presumably, if there's a calculation around budget cuts, dropout rates would then affect that because you're not going to bring in the income that you might have otherwise projected. But these are all things, I think, that we can look at further. Um, so with that, I think we are recognising the significance of this petition. I want to thank the, um, the panel today for the contribution they have made, I think, which has been a very interesting session and, and can assure you I think we will be coming back to this and we will keep you um, aware of the petition as it progresses and you will have the opportunity at each stage to comment on the submissions that were received by um, the committee. So with that, can I thank you very much and can I suspend the meeting briefly to allow the witnesses to leave the table.
If I can call the meeting back to order. Um, we're now going to move on to the next new petition for consideration, which is Petition 1696 on Preserving Scottish Battlefields by Jack Gallagher on behalf of the Boswell Historical Society. The petition is calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to introduce legislation to prevent the development on battlefields as listed on Historic Environment Scotland's inventory of historic battlefields. The SPICE briefing included in our papers explains that Historic Environment Scotland is responsible for designating and preserving Scotland's nationally important battlefields and maintains an inventory of historic battlefields as referred to by the petitioner. Our briefing also highlights that Historic Environment Scotland is a statutory consultee in the planning system and it can formally object to a planning application if it considers that a new development would have a serious adverse impact on sites including on the included on the inventory. While objections from Historic Environment Scotland must be lodged at the consultation stage if the planning authorities decide to grant planning permission and there remains an objection from Historic Environment Scotland, the application must be notified to the Scottish Ministers. The petition raises concerns, however, that battlefields are currently not protected by any legislation and I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Um, well, Rachel. You just quoted a historic environment Scotland's policy statement, um, which does say that uh, it ensures that nationally important battlefields are given consideration in their plans. So I mean, we, we surely should be uh, consulting with them, writing to them um, to, to, to ask them for their views on the, the petitioner's um, uh, perspective. I suppose, I mean, I think it's a really interesting petition and in a sub kind of all these interesting sites that I'm sure we'll all have visited at certain times and the importance of preserving, I guess, the competition is between where there's development needed in a community and to what extent the battlefields are then uh, preserved. I don't pretend to have any expertise or, or knowledge of it, but I, think we, I think it would be interesting finding out a bit more and teasing out is the fact that um, the Historic Environment Scotland is a consultee sufficient so clearly, the petitioner doesn't think it offers sufficient protection because they can make a comment, but it doesn't really trigger yeah. anything. I suppose it does mean that the Scottish ministers have to look at it. Um, so I think I would be interested in, in the Scottish government's view, um, historic environment Scotland too. Anyone else that we could be um, perhaps asking for information from Brian? I think, you know, following from that point, I mean that that whole uh, role as a, st a statutory consultee, I would I'd be quite interested. One to write to the Scottish government anyway, but to under and understand exactly what the, what is meant by statutory consultee and what what impact uh, they, ha they they put, can potentially have in any mm -hmm. yeah, many plans coming forward. Yeah. And are there any examples where development has been refused because? Scottish um, Historic Environment Scotland has yeah. lodged an, an objection. I think Visit Scotland as well will be really interesting because mm -hmm. they probably put in, in context of you know uh, tourism. Yeah. Maybe to put that in context. Okay, so we could maybe be speaking to Visit Scotland and the tourism bodies, yeah. their, their organisation, just to see if there's an issue um, for them. I think it is something. If if the suggestion here is that the this organisation, the Boswell Historical Society and others feel the protections aren't sufficient. One of the things, I guess, is we would need to identify what the evidence is. And I suppose that point I've already made. I would be interested to know that we didn't, you know, on how many occasions has an objection meant that the development hasn't happened? How many occasions has an objection simply been... It's been heard, but then the development has gone on, and I suppose those are questions we can ask of the statutory body itself. Is there anything else we'd want to do? Uh, just, to, just to add to that, convener, would it be um, would it be prudent to ask the local authorities as well, or is that just going a little step too far? I mean, could we get all that information with regard to sort of appeals and? Um, would the first point of call just in terms of that it'd be simply to ask Cosler? Is this an issue that they're aware of? Um, it's been flagged up to them. It may be, yeah. and depending on what we get from that, another response it might be that we would want to look further at that because it, I guess it's not something that's going to affect all local authorities. Mm. It may disproportionately affect some. Is that agreed okay. then? Yes, agreed. Okay, and, and we want to thank the petitioner for um, highlighting this issue. And I think there are some opportunities to explore further um, their concerns. 
So if we can move on to the next petition for consideration, which is Petition 1698, Medical Care in Rural Areas, by Karen Murphy, Jane Rental, David Wilkie, Louisa Rogers and Jennifer Jane Lee. The petition is calling the Scottish Government to ensure strong rural and remote GP representation on the Remote and Rural Short Life Working Group, recently established as part of the new GP contract for Scotland. Adjust the workload allocation formula urgently in light of the new contract proposals to guarantee that both primary and ancillary, ancillary services are at least as good as they are now in all areas so patients do not experience a rural and remote postcode lottery in relation to the provision of health care. Address remote practice and patient concerns raised in relation to the new GP contract. The SPICE briefing included in our meeting papers explains that the new GP contract between the Scottish Government and the British Medical Association came into force on the 1st of April this year. The contract aims to improve access for patients, address inequalities and improve population health, provide financial stability for GPs and reduce GP workloads through the expansion of the primary care multidisciplinary team. The contract offers proposed offer proposes a two-phase approach. Phase one involves the introduction of a new GP workload-based resource allocation formula. Members will note that the petitioners have raised concerns that the new formula will reduce funding for remote and rural practices. These concerns are shared by the Rural GP Association of Scotland, which states that the workforce allocation formula, quote, seems heavily weighted against rural communities. The Scottish Government has set up a remote and rural short life working group and the petitions are, petitioners are seeking strong rural and remote GP representation in this group. In a letter to Scottish Rural Action in March of this year, the Scottish Government stated that, quote, it will ensure that its membership represents a wide range of remote and rural communities from across Scotland. And I wonder if members have comments or suggestions for action. Brian? I think, um as you say, on, in, in the Health and Sport Committee we are obviously very interested in this uh, particular topic as well and have, uh, I, I've started doing work on this as well. So I wonder whether there's, there's a, a, a potential here for sort of cross-referencing across to the work that's been done in that committee. Um, yep. say they're pulling a lot of information together as well. So that might be okay. able to help this petition. Could make sure the clerks are in the two committees and maybe having a conversation about yeah. that. Um, anyone else? I, mean, I was very struck by the strength of feeling, um, you know, I, I don't represent a, a rural area, but I've got family who live in some pretty remote rural areas, and I'm very struck by the suggestion that there hadn't been proper consultation, but, but when there was consultation, they were able to get a lot of people out um, to meetings, and I, wonder, I, I suppose it's, it's about... It looks as if one bit of the GP contract has been, to some extent, fixed... But the other bit, there isn't, there isn't any confidence in it amongst those remote and rural areas. And I suppose we would be um, really wanting to, to get from the Scottish Government a sense of how they're going to deal with that lack of confidence that people are expressing. Angus? Yeah, I mean, clearly that kind of refers to, to phase two of, of the contract and, and there's still to, to go through um, uh, that phase. I mean, there's, there's a recognition in the contract offer um, you know, with regard to the costs of dispensing or, or uh, the diseconomies of, of small-scale GP practices. Uh, and it does say that that will need to be addressed by proposals for, for Phase 2. So it's, it's clearly on the radar, um, but, mm -hmm. but this petition uh, does come in at an opportune time to, to, to highlight the issues. Richard? It's slightly concerning that um, there is an issue that... The there has been a lack of dialogue or perceived lack of dialogue um, with rural and remote communities. And I'm just hoping that, obviously I'm looking at the, uh, the reply from Jean Freeman um, that was given on the 6th of the 7th this year um, with regards to a meeting that um, she was going to get the officials to uh, identify the issues that the group had to discuss at the next meeting, which is to be held in September. So um, I presume that we won't receive the uh, well first of all can we receive what was discussed um, within that meeting um, and and seek the views on the, the action that the government are taking within that working group mm -hmm. I'm not sure if we can and presumably the, the group will, will, will report I suppose from the petitioner's point of view and I'm sure I sense that we would agree with this 
we would want to make sure there was strong rural and remote GP representation on the short life working group and so we can ask the Scottish Government how they're um, doing that. This other issue about the workload allocation formula, I think we would need to ask the Scottish Government for their response to that. I think there's also a suggestion that we would ask the Rural GP Association of Scotland for their views on the petition and on these particular questions. Um, I'm not sure if there are other community groups and organisations that represent the patient interest in, in remote and rural areas that we could be asking. Perhaps these petitions are a reflection of that, and that might be um, an indication that there's an issue. Can I suggest that we, we start by making sure there's a conversation between ourselves and the Health Committee about what's actually been done, um, and also ask the Scottish Government and the Rural GP Association of Scotland for their views on the particular issues that the petition demand. Is that agreed? agreed. Okay. Thank you for that. If we can now move on to the next petition for consideration, which is Petition 1699 by Amanda Digby on release of murder victim bodies for funeral arrangements. The petition calls for the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to change post-mortem examination protocols to allow for the deceased to be released as early as possible to enable families to make funeral arrangements for their loved ones. The briefing note explains that in the event of a murder, an investigation takes place which includes a post-mortem to establish the cause of death and to provide evidence for a criminal prosecution. In Scotland, when someone is then charged with that murder, the defence has the right to carry out its own post-mortem, which may uncover things that were not the focus of the original examination. However, it can sometimes take a long time, possibly years, for someone to be charged. As the petitioner has set out, this can result in a lengthy delay before the victim's body is released for a funeral. The situation is different in England and Wales, where if no one has been charged in connection with a murder and the police do not expect to make an arrest within 28 days, the coroner will arrange for a second post-mortem examination by a pathologist independent of the first. The body can then be released and the coroner retains the report for use by the defence if, in due course, an arrest is made and charges brought. Members will have noted that the Lord Advocate answered a parliamentary question in February to the effect that there is a review of post-mortem examination protocols taking place to enable more effective consultation between pathologists instructed by the Crown and Defence. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Can we when that review is to be concluded? I don't think we've been given a timescale for that, but I think that would... Um, be in itself a useful question to ask. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, I mean, obviously we, we can't comment on the individual circumstance of the case, although we'd want to thank the petitioner to highlight this general issue. I cannot understand why we can't have the same situation um, as, a, a, as a, a model that has been developed elsewhere. It does feel unconscionable that you could be in a position because somebody has not, you know, there's nobody been charged Presumably that you could never have the remains returned to you for burial, and I think, or you know, and I think that must be um, very dis distressing. So I would be interested to know why the the idea that you would, after 28 days, instruct an independent pathologist to produce a second post mortem, which would meet the needs of a defence, should there be a case in the future. I'm not clear why um, that's not an option that has been considered in Scotland, and I would be wanting to ask the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service and the Lord Advocate that question. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why are they different? Yeah. Angus? Well, it would seem to be the, the ideal solution, um, you know, to, to prevent any, any delay in, in releasing uh, the body. So, yeah, mm -hmm. we, we certainly need to ask that question. Yeah. Are there others that we should be... I mean, I suppose if there's an issue about it's the Scottish system... And perhaps we should be looking to the associations in Scotland, like the Law Society of Scotland, the Faculty of Advocates, the Scottish Criminal Bar Association, who may have a view on why they want why there is a distinct system in Scotland does not follow that route, um, and can maybe get their views on that, um, and whether you know, I mean, I don't know, is this an issue about availability of forensic pathologists in Scotland, and maybe we should just be asking. Um, the, the, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, if that's the case, because if it's simply the want of expertise, that is surely something that could be addressed. Mm 
Angus? Um, yeah, if you can. I mean, it might also, also be helpful if we could write to uh, Victim Support Scotland and PETA, uh, seeking their views on the petition. Yes, which is the people experiencing trauma and loss. So there are people yeah. in the, there are other people in the system who may have had the same um, experience as the as the petitioner has, and and want, you know would be able to share their views. Whether this is something that has, I mean, I must confess it's not an issue that has been flagged up to me in the past, but it does feel something that must add to the trauma that's already been experienced. So I think it's a good idea to speak to people who have a direct consequence of that kind of loss as well. So I think we are agreeing that the, the, that if not the model from the rest, you know, from what's what happens south of the border, then what? Because we think what's currently the situation is not um, desirable in any way or, or form, in fact, causes a lot of extra trauma and grief. So we've agreed that we would write to the relevant uh, legal bodies, to Crown Office, Scottish Government, um, and to organisations which represent people who have been in this position. Okay. Agreed. Okay, if that's agreed, and again, we want to thank the petitioner for bringing that petition forward. The next petition for consideration is Petition 1700 by Martin James Keatings on behalf of Forward as One on a progression of the process for a Section 30 order to hold a Scottish referendum on independence from the United Kingdom. The petition calls for the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to seek a Section 30 order from the UK Government to enable it to bring forward legislation in the Scottish Parliament to hold a second referendum on Scotland's independence from the United Kingdom. The briefing note sets out the legislative background surrounding a Section 30 order, which was the mechanism used for the referendum, which took place in 2014. The Parliament has already debated and voted on this in March 2017. The motion that was agreed to on division mandated, quote, the Scottish Government to take forward discussions with the UK Government on the details for an order under Section 30 of the Scotland Act 1998. Members will note that the petitioner has sent a submission for consideration. In it, he states that, quote, so far as the progress in political situation thus far has been left to the media and the politicians to comment, debate and otherwise direct the conversation. The purpose of bringing this matter before the committee was to press for a Section 30 order, but more importantly to allow the electorate, businesses and civic organisations in Scotland the opportunity to directly interact with their Parliament on this substantive constitutional issue by way of the petitions process. I think this is a cross-party committee, so it would not be expected that we will agree on the merits or otherwise of a referendum on independence. But I wonder if members have any comments on the views expressed by the petitioner, either in the petition itself or in the further submission. And do members feel that the electorate businesses and civic organisations in Scotland have not been able to engage with the Parliament on this issue? And I guess if they haven't, what would be the mechanism for that? But the question for us to consider today is what action it might be appropriate for us to take on the petition. Um, I wonder, uh, we, I'm not sure if there's been an update on what the Scottish Government's position is uh, following the, the uh, programme for government, but I wonder if members wish to seek the Scottish Government's views on this issue. Angus? Yeah, um, thanks, Convener. Well, as you've referred to already, this is a, a cross-party um, committee. Um, however, that said, I clearly have a sympathy for the petition. However, um, I think it's, it's worth pointing out that the First Minister has stated she will give clarity on this issue next month, uh, although there, is, there are suggestions, I note, in, in the press this morning um, that that announcement could be uh, later in the year. But it certainly, um, you know, in the first instance, we need to seek uh, clarity from um, the Scottish Government. But I, I do note from uh, in, in the submission from the petitioner, uh, Martin Keatings, in which he, he states his frustration um, at not being given the opportunity to give oral evidence on this petition. But I, I do feel um, you know, the whole issue has been well rehearsed both inside and outside this parliament, um, and uh, the views of everyone are, are, are well known. So uh, I think in the first instance we need to get clarification from the Scottish Government as to to where they are uh, with regard to this, and certainly with regard to Section 30 order, um, and uh, we should write to them uh, forthwith. Okay, is that agreed? agreed. Yeah. Okay, I mean, I think that's, I mean, is one of these issues where people do have strong views, but there's also in my sense that this is a conversation that's gone on in different parts of the 
communities in different ways, um, and not just whether there should be a referendum, but what would the mechanism be for that. But I think it would be useful to know from the Scottish Government in the first instance what their view specifically is on, I guess it's almost about the timing of a mechanism. I think the Scottish Government's already identified as the one that would be useful. And we would want to thank the petitioner for the petition and for the submission that was sent to us. If we can then move on to the... Um, the final new petition for consideration today is Petition 1702 on Counselling Provision in All Schools by Joanne Waddell. The petition calls for the Scottish Government to ensure that by 2022 all pupils will have access to trained counsellors in schools. As members will be aware, the Scottish Government's programme for government includes a range of new measures to help children and young people access schools counselling services. The petitioner has indicated to the clerks that, based on this announcement, she is content for a petition to be closed. This petition emphasises the importance of early intervention and prevention to support children and young people with mental ill health. And while the petitioner has indicated that she is content to close the petition, we may wish to reflect on the detail of the, this petition as we consider the scope of the committee's inquiry on how young people can access mental health services and treatments. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? Um, well, I, th I think I mean, the petition obviously ha ha does raise raise issues that are, you know, consistently spoken about within the chamber and uh, and across all, all the political spectrums. And I think um, it has been really useful. Some of the evidence they've they've brought forward has been very useful. So I, I would be inclined to to, you know, as, as you say, maybe. Before we before we go to po the point where we're going to close the petition, that, that we have with the opportunity to reflect on that evidence as it pertains to other. I think we can we, we can do both. I mean, the petitioner yeah. says she's content for the petition to be closed. I think we could close the petition, but in this bit of work we've already agreed to do, round access um, to mental health um, support for young people, prompted in particular by Alison Mackenzie's petition. Um, I think we can draw on, on some of this, and it may be indeed that the petitioner herself may want to reflect, you know, later whether what has developed with the Scottish Government satisfies um, what prompted the petition um, in in the first place. Because I think you know there's there's a question about professional counsellors, but there's also about the training of frontline teaching staff in counselling, which is maybe something slightly different that I would be interested to explore um, as well. Can I suggest that we do agree? to close the petition under Rule 15.7 on the basis the pet petitioner has indicated that she wishes to withdraw the petition, but that absolutely we take on board to the issues that are highlighted in the petition around our own inquiry. Would that be agreed? Agreed. Okay, thank you very much. So we're now moving on to Agenda Item 3, which is the consideration of continued petitions. Our next agenda item is uh, Petition 1463, Effective Thyroid and Adrenal Testing, Diagnosis and Treatment. Um, by Sandra White, Mandra Dyer and Lorraine Cleaver. The committee last considered this petition earlier in the year, in March, and subsequently published its report. The report focused on four main areas, guidance framework, diagnosis and testing, treatment and research. The committee also agreed that it should seek time in the debating chamber for consideration of the issues raised in the petition. The committee has received a response from the Scottish Government to the report, and the response is included in the briefing paper. Um, Elaine S Smith, MSP, also provides some information that the committee may wish to know. Elaine has given her apologies for today. She's unable to be here as she is unwell. Um, obviously, many of the issues, and we'll make sure this is circulated to the membership uh, of the committee, many of the issues that she highlights, will obviously be, there will be an opportunity to raise these in the debate. Um, but she does specifically ask a number of questions, one of which is, emphasising the importance of a consistent approach um, needed in primary care, not just in secondary care. And she wants to know um, whether the Scottish Government will now issue a written edict to health boards before any more patients are removed from their life-saving um, medication. I certainly won't experience of this being inconsistent at GP level. Um, and in terms of listening, um, she particularly flags up the question of whether the Scottish Government will undertake another properly conducted listening exercise having admitted that the previous one did not meet its objectives. Um, and she also highlights their feedback from the recent Scottish Women's Convention Health Conference. And I think these can be included in our these comments can be included in our considerations. Um, 
we have asked for time to be set out in the business programme for the Chamber for a debate, and I think we anticipate that being scheduled for later this year. And I wonder whether members want to comment on the response or any other aspect of the petition. Rachel? How likely is it that uh, we will be given time um, to uh, debate in the Chamber the issues that have been raised? Yeah, I think it's petition? highly likely because it's been we've raised it with the Communist Group already and it's been agreed by the Communist Group, so it would be a committee slot. Um, and I think it's one that they recognise that there is an interest in. Um, there was certainly interest when there was a members debate held by Lane Smith. So I think the, um, as a consequence of that, that, I think we can be confident that we will get a, um, a good slot in the chamber. And of course, because of that, there's an obligation. The Scottish Government has to respond to the debate, has to open it and respond to the debate. So there'll yeah. be opportunity to explore these issues um, that we identified in our report, but also that other members have concerns about. Okay. Brian? I think, I think that the... the uh, Getting a debate in the chamber is, is the obvious, uh, the obvious it's next step. I don't think there's, there's nothing, there's much else we can do currently, uh, okay. other than wait for our time slot. Okay, so we're noting um, the Scottish Government's response to the committee's report, and we would, we're noting too that in the parliamentary business programme, a debate in the chamber will offer uh, an opportunity for these issues to be further explored. Um, is there any other action at this stage? Perhaps it's something we can come back to after the the debate in the chamber, because there may be issues flagged up around there and it would be useful. Okay. In that case, if we can then move on to the next petition for consideration, which is Petition 1600 by John Chapman on Speed Awareness Courses. We last considered this petition in September 2017. At that meeting, we noted the Scottish Government's position that Speed Awareness Courses um, was a matter for the Lord Advocate. We also considered previous submissions from the Lord Advocate in which he noted the three-year evaluation being undertaken by the Department of Transport and confirmed that he had given authorisation for Police Scotland to undertake more detailed scoping work on the viability of speed awareness courses. In the most recent submissions, both Police Scotland and the Lord Advocate note that the Department for Transport published the findings of its three-year evaluation in May. Police Scotland adds that scoping work is continuing and no proposal has yet been submitted to the Lord Advocate. The Clark's note identifies findings from the Department for Transport evaluation include that speed awareness courses appear to have a greater effect than fixed penalty notices and those effects appear to persist over time. The petitioner sets out his concern that Police Scotland is delaying submitting a proposal to the Lord Advocate due to the financial implications of delivering speed awareness courses. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. I have to say I share the petitioner's frustration. that something that feels and looks sensible and straightforward is just not being progressed. And I think we need to think about, my view is we need to think about how we um, break that logjam. Because the Lord Advocate's saying, well, they're doing a scoping exercise. The Scottish Government's saying, we've asked, this is a matter of the Lord Advocate. I wonder if it's a matter of the Scottish Government to be a, a matter of policy, saying they want something developed through Police Scotland. I mean, I think we changed our laws and drink driving. I don't think we just left that to Police Scotland and the Lord Advocate to decide when that would happen. And I just, I, I might be missing something. This feels eminently sensible and works. And I think I would want to be asking the Scottish Government, whether they agree that the evidence says it works, and if so, what can they do to make this scoping plan actually stop scoping and start working? Angus? Yeah, um, <clears throat> thanks, Convener. I agree with you. It's, it's quite frustrating that this uh, scoping work is, is taking so long to complete, and I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I can't blame the petitioner. Uh, for coming to the, the view uh, that the delay in delivering the action called for in the petition is owing to the financial implications of doing so. Um, I'd certainly be keen to, to write to the Scottish Government to get their view. However, you know, um, you're always wary of, of being accused of interfering in operational issues uh, with Police Scotland. Um, but given that they've taken so long to get this scoping work done, uh, I think it's legitimate to try and find mm -hmm. out why there's been such a delay. Would it be worth asking them to come before the committee? Well, yeah. Because if it's a policy issue, you know, get the minister along and ask Police Scotland to come. Because the parallel that I draw is the one with um, uh, changing the, the drink driving rules, which I think is a policy change, which was then enacted by government. So, 
no, not by government, by police. Well, whoever it been at to buy, but you know, so, so, so it's a sort of a chicken and egg situation. <laughs> well, everybody seems to think. Well, I suppose what I want to know is, if they think it's a bad idea, can they just tell us? And if it's a good idea, why is it not being progressed? And if it's a good idea that's not being progressed, what is stopping it being progressed? Um, and you know. I can see, I hear what the petitioner says that it's about finance, but presumably in the longer term, if it's more effective, then it's what we were talking about earlier about spending to save because it would actually save lives and stop people perhaps reoffending in the same way around speed. I'd like to um, add that it, is it is it the perception that the uh, financial implication is regarding the scoping work, or is the financial implication about um, bringing it uh, you know uh, into into existence is it what is it that's holding them back as you quite rightly mm -hmm. say I think perhaps we should write to the minister uh, to ask him to um, mm -hmm. give us his views on why this is taking so long mm -hmm. or, or and as Can you we, say mm -hmm. that whether you, you you say yes or no yeah. I mean I, I was quite surprised I mean I suppose it's less a symptom of being old it didn't feel like <laughs> September 2017 when we last discussed this Maybe we should just cut to the chase and get them to come to committee, maybe get the, the clerks to get the government officials and the police or whoever would be the appropriate people to come and explain. Because, you know, is it because the scoping exercise is expensive or is it what's coming out of the scoping exercise that's a concern or is it simply not a priority because there's a million other things that they have to do? Um, and I suppose it would just be worthwhile hearing from them. I think the, the, um, it's, it's fairly obvious that it's there's obviously going to be a financial implication, but that shouldn't be the, the driving force. Yeah. I mean, if you're not going to have a fix, if you're not going to have fixed penalties anymore. Yeah, well. <laughs> then, you know, there's a financial implication. Am I my sense is that? Am I sense is that they both? You can still have both. I mean, you can't. You couldn't keep going to speed awareness courses. There kind of comes a point where you'd be triggered off into oh, fixed okay, penalty notices yeah. and losing your license yeah. anyway. So, yeah. um, can I? I think we're agreed that we want to respond to the petitioner's frustration in this and just get the appropriate people in um, before the committee. So if that's agreed, we can move on to the next petition for consideration, which is Petition 1642 on sale and marketing of energy drinks to under-16s by Norma Austin Hart. The committee last considered this petition in March and agreed to defer further consideration until the publication of the Scottish Government's new diet and obesity strategy. The strategy has now been published and includes a commitment to consult on restricting the sale of energy drinks to young people under the age of 16. Members may also be aware that the UK Government have recently launched a consultation seeking views on the banning of energy drinks to children. The petitioner welcomes the action taken by the UK Government and questions whether the Scottish Government will take similar action. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Well, convener, um, Rachel. I have um, experience of this because I um, had a head teacher come to me with regards to this and saying that uh, pupils in the class were being disrupted because of um, their consumption of energy drinks. So um, I did actually write to um, the Justice um, that, well, to Michael Matheson at the time, and uh, I think his response was that uh, the Scottish Government uh, would wait until they heard what uh, position the UK Government took. And I am actually unclear as to how that uh, impacts, how the UK Government's um, decision impacts on the Scottish Government's um, decision. So perhaps what I'm saying is that we have to uh, wait to see how the UK government take this forward? Is, is it, is it, it's not, it's devolved. Well, my, as, oh, I we, we could, we, we, we could if, if, I'm not saying we do, I'm saying we could take a different path we, if, we, you know, for, if, if it was so desired, I think. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not quite... Well, I'm assuming that the UK government is consulting in England, I'm assuming it's not consulting in Wales, but this is maybe something that we could establish. I think that the, the petitioner said um, you welcomed the fact that the UK government um, was looking at a ban. I suppose the question to the Scottish government is, are you looking at this too? Because it, I think everybody's on the same page agreeing there's an issue and a problem. It's whether you restrict it in public buildings or buildings over which you could control, or do you go for an all-right ban? And that is what the seems to be been consulted on at a UK level, so would it be sensible simply to ask the Scottish Government for an update um, and ask you know, whether they um, have any plans to consult in the same terms as the UK Government is? 
And the only issue we need to decide then, well, I suppose we would keep the petition open until we get that response. Mm -hmm. Is that agreed? Okay, thank you. Okay, so we can move on to the next petition. Which, uh, for consideration, which is Petition 1665 on Common Law of Blasphemy by Mark McCabe. We last considered this petition in March when we reviewed the Scottish Government's response to the petition, which stated that there were no plans formally to abolish the common law crime of blasphemy. The Committee, however, agreed to defer consideration of the petition until the independent review of hate crime legislation in Scotland had been published, as crimes motivated by religious hatred would be covered in this review. The recommendations resulted resulting from the review were published in May. The review concluded that it was not necessary to extend the religious aggravation to capture religious or other beliefs and that the courts can use common law powers to impose higher sentences if necessary. An additional written submission in relation to this petition has been received from the Humanist Society Scotland since our papers were circulated and members have been provided with a copy of this submission for our meeting today. The submission states that the Scottish Government intends to launch a formal consultation in response to the review of recommendations based on a period of engagement which will include consideration as to whether the common law offence of blasphemy should feature in the consultation. The Society, however, raises concerns that attended the Scottish Government's first hate crime stakeholders group in August and blasphemy was not part of any of the Government's written plans at this meeting. The Society is therefore of the view that the Government has no plans to take any action in relation to blasphemy in a formal consultation. The Scottish Government has contacted the Clarks to explain that the Humanist Society Scotland met with officials in June to discuss the Society's campaign on blasphemy law, among other issues, and that they were represented at the stakeholder engagement meeting in August where blasphemy law was considered. The Scottish Government confirms that it is currently engaging with stakeholders in relation to the independent review of hate crime legislation recommendations to help inform the key issues and concerns for inclusion in a public consultation to be launched in autumn this year. This will include seeking views on the common law offence of blasphemy and whether there is justification for including relevant proposals relating to this offence in the public consultation. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. I think. Yeah. We already understand that the, the Scottish Government um, has no plans um, to, abolish, to abolish common law crime or blasphemy. Um, and and give, given the, the Scottish Government's position, I, I think we possibly should consider closing the petition. Yeah. We have, I think that's one option, and the other option is given the late or the the later submission from the Scottish Government clarifying their position, whether we simply ask them to update us on a public consultation planned in the autumn? Or do we take a view that, you know, the kind of the petition has raised these issues, Scottish Government's aware of them, they're engaged with stakeholders, including the Humanist Society in this, and that perhaps there's not a role for the Public Petitions Committee any longer? Well, I, I think that's the case, Convener. Having read the submission from the Humanist Society Scotland, um, you know, they have made the Scottish Government aware um, at the Hate Crime Stakeholder Group on the 15th of August um, of their, their views. Um, so it may well be that the Government do decide to include that in any formal consultation, but at the moment uh, I'm minded to, to close the petition, um, given that the Scottish Government's already stated that it's no plans to abolish the common law crime of, of blasphemy. But, um, Perhaps we could write to the Scottish Government, just highlighting, the, if we are to close it, we could still uh, highlight the Humanist Society Scotland's submission to the Scottish Government in closing it. Okay. Is there an alternative view? Are we agreed that we would want to close the petition, but we would write to the Scottish Government simply highlighting, as uh, Angus has identified, um, the, the, the new information from the Humanist Society in Scotland? Okay. Is that agreed? Okay. I want to ask... Um, this piece of uh, evidence that came in uh, just says that there is a lack of commitment to a formal consultation at this stage um, from the Humanist Society. And I just wondered, um, would we be confident that the review um, will inform a period of formal consultation and that would be sufficient? Might I suggest that we write to them and highlight the Humanist Society's uh, view on this, but also remind the petitioner that they, of course, can submit a petition again in the future if they feel that that I agree has that. not been addressed. And I think it may be that would 
um, allow the matter either to be addressed or not. Okay. Okay. Um, and we do know that the Scottish Government has already said that it's engaging with stakeholders in relation to the independent review of hate crime um, and to help inform the issues in terms of their consultation. But if we're agreeing um, that, that we close the petition, we'd want to thank the petitioner for highlighting these issues and um, remind them, as I've said, that you know in the future there's an opportunity to resubmit a petition um, on these issues or as how the, the, the matter is developed. The final position for consideration today is Petition 1686 on Homelessness Crisis in Scotland by Sean Clarkin. We last considered this petition in May when we agreed to write to the Scottish Government, COSLA, the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations and Shelter Scotland. The briefing summarises the submissions received, including from the petitioner. Members will note that the submission from the then Minister for Local Government and Housing was essentially superseded by the Minister's statement to the Parliament on 27th June. In his written submission and subsequent statement to the Parliament, the Minister states that the Scottish Government's Homelessness Prevention um, and Strategy Group will consider all the recommendations of the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group, as well as the Local Government and Communities Committee, and will report back to the Parliament in due course. In her statement on the programme for government last week, the First Minister stated that before the end of the year, the Scottish Government will publish a comprehensive action plan which will set out how the government expects to deliver on all of the homelessness and rough sleeper action group's recommendations. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? Yeah. Well, I, I think for, for certain the, the, uh, the petition has a great deal of merit um, and actually makes in my mind, makes a, 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 a great deal of sense. And I wonder whether or not it would be uh, for another committee to take this forward into the Local Government and Communities Committee uh, for work that they're currently doing at the moment. Yeah. Angus? Yeah, um, following on from uh, Brian Huddle's point, I, I note the petitioner has suggested himself that the petition should be sent to the Local Government and Communities Committee, uh, and I'm happy to move that, convener. Okay. I mean, I was very struck by because I think there's a general consensus that the issue of homelessness, rough sleeping, it should be prioritised. That these are important matters. Where where this contention is, where the, the the way in which the petitioner envisaged how the money would be spent, which would be to front load it and build houses, against some of the people within the housing sector who felt actually the the running time for these kind of things are, is is. It's longer than that, but also that a lot of the sports that homeless people require, not just simply about the tenancy, it's about the supports you can um, wrap around them. So I, I, while there, you know, there was clearly a very interesting argument to be had there, and I think merits on both sides, I certainly take the view that perhaps, given the petitioner's own preference for it being um, referred to the Local Government and Communities Committee, which has done quite a lot in housing, um, that that might be a useful way of it being taken forward. Following on for that, I mean, I think you're right. There, there is, in terms of how the money should be spent, there's, there's obviously a, a, a bit of negotiation going on, or, or, or different discussions going on around there. But the actual premise of front loading, um, I, you know, I think, I think has has made it. I think that's definitely something that should be brought, continue to be brought forward. Mm -hmm. in terms okay. of Rachel, if we do pass it to the local government and communities uh, committee, um, there may be an opportunity uh, to for other. Um, housing federations or whatever it might be to give submissions and for this to be looked at in much more detail yeah yeah because there's huge amounts of expertise out in the sector i mean there's no doubt about that angus there, there are of course issues with front, front loading um, i'm aware of a, the situation in the western isles where um you know there's there's a time limit to the to, to, to when the building can proceed um and uh, the western isles the situation is that they're having difficulty finding enough land to spend the money that they've already been allocated, and if that is, is rushed uh, even further, then that'll create more more difficulties. So it, it needs looked at uh, in more detail, and uh, um, certainly the, the local government and communities committee can do that. Okay, so I think we're, we're agreeing that we want to refer the petition to the local government and communities committee, and we'd want to thank the petitioner for bringing the petition forward, and. Um, Obviously, he will be able to, to follow the considerations of the, the local government and communities committee in relation to the issues that he's flagged up. So um, I think that has, has come to the end of our agenda. And with that, I want to thank everyone and close the meeting. <laughs>